I worked with Peter O'Toole on Troy, and my father and, and Peter were great friends. We used to drink quite a lot together. And so I, I knew Peter when I was a little boy, and then I knew him a bit more uh, when we worked on Troy. And he's one of these actors that um, we will never see his like again. He was tremendous. I've been, I've been told that um, a lot of the actors now read the script, when they get the scripts, they read them from the back <laughs> to see if they're still there. Because George uses that very clever device of killing off your favourite characters, you know, as he did in the first season or And uh, I had read the books and I sort of didn't want to know. But my friend that Bill Flyfish, who was in America, he read all the books. So he used to torment me, telling, telling sort of dropping hints about when I was going to die. Um, but actually, um, I managed to get three seasons out of it, which I thought was very generous of We wanted to make Lord Normans exit quite special, you know. Um, so I was, I was really happy. I mean, three seasons in a show of Game of Thrones is, is terrific, you know. I had such a good time on it, and, and it was a privilege to be involved in a show that's, that's become such a worldwide phenomenon, you know. I was very happy. Well, I, I, I tell you what, Patrick McGowan, when he played uh, Edward in Braveheart, I thought he was, he was just tremendous and because he was such a nasty character that he had no good side to him at all. And Patrick um, uh, really took hold of that part and made it his own, you know. And, but he always used to make me, me laugh because um, uh, he had a sort of study nose like me, uh, but every morning he'd stick this great big hook nose on him, you know. And it just made me giggle to see it. And of course, Mel Gibson, who was directing as well as starring, he's a wonderful um, sense of humour, he's a terrible practical joker, and um, it's quite uh, dangerous to be on the set with him because he'll do something to you. But he always used to, um, if, you, if you made a mistake or fluff your lines or whatever, he would make you do it again with one of these stick on clowns' noses. <laughs> and I always remember watching Patrick having to do a scene not only with a false nose on, but then a red thing <laughs> stuck in the end of false nose. <laughs> I would say there were two. The first one was, um, it was actually when I, when I was um, approached to, to, to play Lord Mormon, they gave me the, the script of, of when Mormon talks to the new recruits about the Night Watch and, and what they stand for and everything else, you know. And it said everything about Mormon's character, you know, what a, what a dedicated, decent, and honourable man he was, you know, leading this. This, um, holding this office that has been around 300 years or whatever, you know. And so I, that was the part that I read of, you know, you go on tape and they send it away to LA and then, you know, they come back and say, yes, no, maybe, I don't know. But that's the part I read. So I was really, I was quite nervous because it was quite early on in the show. And um, it was a big long chunk of work. But I really enjoyed that, it worked really well. And then I enjoyed my death quite a lot, <laughs> you know? um, because it, they wanted it to be a real surprise, you know. Because for the, for the folk that hadn't read the book, you know, you think, "Well, Lord Mormon, of course he's not going to die," you know. And they just wanted that moment, you know, when when you think, "Oh, I've got this guy against the wall, and he's been about to run through, and then blood starts spotting out." And we we had a lot of fun doing it, you know. And we really wanted it to be quite an impact. Full scene, which all of it was. Who's the fat guy? Sam. Sam. Uh, Sam. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because I, I eat puns as well. <laughs> um, I think that's probably the, near, the nearest to me. But I'm. It's funny because um, you play the character of Lord Mormon, but I, I really like Lord Mormon because he's. He's one of, I can't think of anyone else who is, you know, what you see is what you got, you know, he was just a straight down the line sort of guy and, and did the best thing he could do um, to keep everyone safe, you know, so I, I really admired him, I, I liked him a lot.
But that's not to say I have the same attributes as you have. I, in, the, in the show, I had a sort of relationship with Jon Snow, a sort of a bunkular, um, you know, because Mormont's son had gone, and, and I think Mormont saw in Jon Snow something that, you know, the seed of, of what he could be, you know, so I would like to see uh, Jon Snow continue and, and to gain the, that iron throne with, with George Hughes. <laughs> Um, I've, I've only kept a few things. I kept, um, when I did Braveheart, there was a scene where, Mel, where Wallace gives out um, the seal of the, the Kingdom of Scotland to his four generals. And I, had, I uh, kept that, and I, I still have it. And um, the only other thing I kept was my helmet from Troy. Um, which was a, it was meant to be brass, but it was actually leather and it's a painting with brass paint and things. Just to remind me that um, if you're riding a horse with swords and everything else, try and get a helmet that fits. <laughs> <laughs> because it tended to slip down over my eyes and I would be taking it out the horse, not knowing where I was going. <laughs> but um, I, I have that in my living room and look at my life at some time. So. <laughs> Well, I mean, George can certainly come up with some horrible deaths, you know, he's got an extremely fertile imagination. <laughs> but the, I think the great thing, one of the great things about Game of Thrones is that, that he does create such complex and vivid characters. And the people that you, you really, really hate, you don't want to see them go, you know, because he adds so much drama to it, you know. Um, so I'm quite happy for, you know, people to be as nasty as they like in George Martin's own own way of writing. Um, I think they add so much flavour to it and to, to get emotions from people who are really disliking characters, I think it's wonderful. I did a bit, because obviously I don't know if any of you other folk have seen Sons. Yeah. Ooh, yeah, great. Um, I really, really like that character as an actor because he was extremely complex. You just didn't know in his psychology, was he a good man doing bad things or was a bad man doing bad things? Or, it was a very, very interesting guy to play. Uh, and obviously through the, the troubles in Ireland and all that sort of that, I, that we all grew up with and things, or maybe more my generation, you know, it was, it was very interesting and quite brave of them to, to uh, approach that whole thing, you know, and as I was saying, you know, the nasty characters, the, the complex and, and deeply damaged people like that are always very interesting to practice to play. It's very hard practice to play normal Joes, you know, when you, when you get the teeth into, into a very complex character, that's where the real joy of acting comes in. So yeah, I, I, I did enjoy it and did quite a bit of research on it, yeah. I've just finished a film called Pyramid Texts, which um, I've been in the business 15 years now, and um, I think that's, it's the best work I've done, but that's, you know, it's, that's subjective, you know, I don't know if people like it or not like it. I'm very proud of that. I did a film, Jared Butler's first film called The One More Kiss, which was a really low budget film, uh, cost hardly anything, uh, but it was a great script and a great performance. But my fellow actors were wonderful in it, and uh, that was a joy. And then, of course, you get films that break up, and you say, Wow, who would have believed that I could have been in a movie like that? And you just feel tremendous a privilege. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a few of them, but quite often it's the films that you haven't heard of that um, you get the greatest joy from. Yeah, it was, um, it was interesting because um, Andrew Alexander that directed it wanted, and C.S. Lewis obviously, they didn't want that um, sort of chocolate box or the Coca-Cola Santa Claus, you know, the whole, whole, whole thing. They wanted him to be uh, the spirit of, of, of nature, you know, 
Uh, and I threw, although it was only a small part of the movie, they, they flew me out to New Zealand and I was there for months while they created the costume and the, the, the beer and everything else. Um, and it's a wonderful privilege because the, the first army was a, a massive success. I think so well. And as an actor, I just felt it was a real, it was a wonderful feeling to be part of children's imagination. But when they watched that, they were looking at you and believing that that was the spirit of Christmas, that was, that was Father Christmas. I've just got a wee short story to tell you. Uh, about six months after Narnia came out, I was in Waitrose and Twickenham, where I live, and I was at the cheese counter, and I was looking at different cheeses to buy. And this little girl came up, she must have been about eight. Her mum must have been somewhere, but she was just in the room. And I could see she was looking at me. And I just had a beard, I put her in a long beard or anything. And she kept looking at me. And I looked down and she said, You're fine, this And I just nodded. <laughs> and she went away. Isn't that lovely to be part of a child's imagination? It was just before dawn, and um, they stuck this false arrow in me. And uh, uh, Mel said, uh, Hey, Jimmy, he said, uh, if someone pulled an arrow off your chest, what would you say to me? And I said, I said, I'll wake up in the morning, boy. And he said, Keep it in. <laughs> so I wrote that line. I'm very proud of that. But um, I, I, again, I enjoyed my death in great haunts. And here's another example of how, what a generous soul. I know Mel gets a lot of bad press and things, and most of it's utter nonsense. Um, but here's a, a sign of the, the generosity and the understanding that he has as a director and an actor, which he started to do when we were rehearsing my death scene. And um, he came up and he said, um, obviously it's a big scene to you now. And he said, um, you know the cheapest thing on the set? He said, have you any idea what was the cheapest thing on this whole set? And I said, no, I have no idea. He said, the celluloid in that camera, use as much as you like. <laughs> and that is a wonderful thing for an actor because it means that if I want to do it 20 times, that's fine. And that tension is broken. And of course you do it a couple of times and it's fine. You know? But it just shows that understanding of the acting process and caring about your fellow actors. Always remember that. <laughs>